Jeanne Dobler, Matt Easton here, Scholar Gladiatoria, and today we're going to look at the famous 1934 Polish sable, Shabla. Um, now this is an incredibly iconic sword and very important in Poland's history because it was the really the last military sword that um, Poland designed and used in warfare. It has come back today as a ceremonial model used by the Polish army, um, but this was the sword that was carried in 1939 uh, when the Germans invaded, um, and it was also the product of a, a line of development that came from older Polish shavers from the 18th century, right the way through to the 1921 model, which was devised after um, World War I and after essentially uh, Poland became a country again in 1918 and the subsequent Polish-Soviet War. So let's just deal with its characteristics in simple terms firstly before I go a little bit more into the history and the characteristics uh, and development of the weapon. Um, so it is, as you can see, a somewhat, certainly for a m almost middle of the uh, 20th century, you know, 90, well, at least the first third, 1934, it is quite an archaic looking sword. Um, but uh, one thing you have to recognise is that cavalry warfare in uh, Central and Eastern Europe was still very much more a thing um, uh, during World War I and after World War I than it was maybe from a Western perspective, uh, looking at you know, people's typical ideas of, of uh, trench warfare, for example. So um, cavalry swords were still used um, even up until the Second World War and during the Second World War. Um, so this is based on earlier models. Um, or earlier styles of sabre, should we say. So it does look, as I say, quite archaic. It doesn't necessarily look like something from the 1930s. It looks like a sword from, um, from the 18th century in some ways, except for when we get into some details of its hilt design, which we'll look at at a moment. So the basic characteristics are it has a predominantly single-edged sabre blade, which is moderately curved. It's not greatly curved like a 1796 like cavalry sabre, for example, or shamshir or kilich or anything like that. It's a gentle curve. It's more or less straight for about the first um, 12 inches or 30 centimetres, and then it curves equally and gradually after that and terminates in a spear point, that is the point, as I've spoken about in previous videos, is in alignment with the centre of the blade. It's not orientated towards the back of the blade, which would be a hatchet point. So it's a spear point, and then it has a full sedge of around um, 7 inches or 15 centimetres on the back here. It has a predominantly single broad fuller in the centre of the blade, but you'll notice it has a narrow fuller at the back of the blade, which if this was a French sword would be known as a Montmorency um, uh, fuller, so secondary narrow fuller at the spine of the blade. In fact, you do find that feature on earlier Polish swords and swords from other parts of Central and Eastern Europe as well. You find it on Russian swords, Hungarian swords, and so on and so forth. It has a small uh, ricasso, although it's not a particularly defined ricasso, um, so hopefully you can see uh, that area blunt there. It has a characteristic um, single knuckle bow with no side guards, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. A rear quillon, which unusually has a um, aperture or hole through it in a sort of teardrop shape. Um, I'll talk about the grip in a second. And then it has a pommel cap, which is actually kind of a real pommel. And that's actually somewhat unusual, for certainly for sabres of this period, for the pommel to be an actual pommel. Uh, but it's a, a pommel. And the pommel and the knuckle bow uh, and guard with the langettes and the very characteristic uh, langettes. Just look at them here, very characteristic langettes again, which are emulating the style of earlier uh, Polish and, uh, and other swords. Um, and they are made of a sort of a copper alloy, I would describe it as bronze pretty much. Um, it's, n it's much more of a bronzy colour than a brassy colour on the originals. There are replicas made of these and they tend to use brass on the modern ones, but the, uh, the originals tend to be a darker, uh, they, um, they get a patina on them which is darker than brass normally gets uh, in my um, experience and opinion. And the grip, okay, the grip is very characteristic and it's one of the main things that uh, can show you the difference between this and the earlier 1921 uh, model. And it's made of two wooden um, slabs, a bit like a bayonet grip, that are held by um, locking uh, well, not in a bolt essentially, but with a, like a screw head on the top here, and then a recessed circular, um, a recessed circular nut 
uh, embedded into the wooden grip here with these characteristic grooves to assist uh, grip and you can see the join at the front of the grip here okay I will put a link below this video incidentally to um, my listing on my website so this sword is um, currently at the time of filming this video up for sale uh, on uh, Eastern Antique Arms website my, which is my antique business which is my, my kind of day job as it were aside from making uh, videos and um, this uh, by the time you watch this video this may have been um, sold already these have become incredibly um, desirable and uh, relatively rare actually they're not super super rare um, but they are so sought after by collectors that their value has um, skyrocketed um, and they're very sought after things for a number of reasons uh, partly they are very nice swords partly there aren't a huge number of them around and partly they are very important to Polish history. Um, so let's just unpack those things for a second. So first of all, uh, is it a nice sword? So yes, um, it is a nice sword. It's very robust. It's not uh, hugely long, okay? It's not, a, it's not a big, big cavalry sword. It's not hugely light, but it's not hugely heavy either. It tracks and moves very, very nimbly and nicely. Um, it has a lot of authority in the cut, so the point of balance is fairly far from the hand, partly due to the fact that we have a relatively light hilt. We don't have a very big guard. We don't have side um, bars on the guard and this kind of stuff. Um, so it, it balances nicely and it has a lot of authority in the uh, cutting portion of the blade. And this was famed and even today is recognized as a very good cutting sword on a par with something like the 1796 Light Cavalry Sabre with which it shares some characteristics. It's a different shaped blade, but it has a similar sort of authority in the cut. Based on my experience of uh, um, swords from different countries, for military swords from the 19th century, the closest parallels to this sword are actually the Italian Model 1833, which I recently did a, a video about, the British 1788, uh, which was the pre precursor to the 1796 Light Cavalry Sabre, the Light Cavalry version I was talking about, um, and also some Austro-Hungarian um, sabres of the 19th century. Now, whilst Austrian, Austrian and Austro-Hungarian sabres tend to have more in the way of protection for the hand, so they tend to have some uh, uh, forms of um, shell hilt or um, th three bar hilts or other types of guard which have more protection. Um, they do feel in the hand somewhat similar to this and I, I have had and do have um, Austrian um, 1858 and 61 I think or is it or 68 uh, pattern swords and they do feel similar to this. So I think it's not a coincidence, and there is a relationship of development there, it is not a coincidence that the Polish sword that was developed in 1934, I think has some relationship to the uh, swords that uh, perhaps were being uh, emulated, which went before in Poland, and also kind of related um, types of swords, particularly in the Austro-Hungarian Empire um, as well, and to some degree um, with Russian swords as well. The, the Shashka um, has some similarities with this, although I must say this is much, much better build quality than uh, the Russian swords that I have mostly been exposed to. Um, so yes, it handles very, very nicely. It's not the most nimble sword in the world, but it, as you can see, I can move it fairly nimbly and fairly quickly from different angles and I can ch move, it tracks nicely and it moves around very nicely. So it, it is relatively nimble for a cavalry sword, but it is a cavalry sword. So you shouldn't expect it to be as nimble as a, as a you know, an, an infantry officer's sword um, or a, a spadroon or anything like this. Um, it is an authoritative, powerful cutting, uh, and of course you can trust it as well, but it's um, got a lot of authority in the cut as a cavalry weapon, and that is what it was designed as. So the next thing is, why is it so important uh, to, why is this model of sword 
so important uh, in Polish history? Well, quite simply because it owes a lot to Polish swords that went before. And, you know, Poland's history has been very turbulent. Um, and uh, for a certain period of time there in the 19th century, Poland wasn't really recognised as a country. Um, so it's, it's been kind of in this push and pull. And geographically, it's been stuck between these great military powers either side of it. Um, and Poland, of course, Polish soldiers, Polish cavalry, have fought for other nations. So famously, um, the Polish lancers fighting for um, Napoleon, for example, in the Napoleonic Wars. So, um, in fact, there are accounts of uh, combats and encounters with Polish cavalry in, in British accounts from the Napoleonic Wars, because there were Polish troops in Napoleon's army. Um, but by 1918, um, Poland essentially was a country again, was an independent country, and was basically looking to re-establish its identity, its national identity, uh, patriotic pride, and this kind of stuff. So what came next with the 1921 sword and then the 1934 sword were really about trying to have a a characteristically Polish style sword. And the sabre, the szabla, is an incredibly important icon in Polish history that goes all the way back to uh, resistance against all sorts of enemies back into the uh, 15th century, pretty much. Um, and the szabla really came into its own in Poland in the 16th, 17th century. Um, and was famously carried by the winged lancers, for example. They had different types of sword, but they carried a type of saber. They also carried a type of vestok and, of course, lances. Um, so the lance and the saber, particularly, are, are kind of very beloved in Poland and seen very much as national weapons. So when after the, sec uh, after the First World War and uh, concluded, 1918, Poland's re-establishing its sort of national identity. And um, one of the things which relates to, uh, which very much national identity has been manifested in, is military equipment. And anybody who knows anything about helmets from uh, the First and Second World War, for example, the famous Tommy helmet, the, the type of um, uh, the pickle hub, um, Prussian helmets, and then the later um, types of uh, Stalin helm, I think they're called the, the German helmets, which are based a little bit on, on uh, salets and stuff like this. You will know that military equipment, obviously uniforms, but helmets, even things like bayonets um, and swords, owe a lot to sort of national identity. So when you look at 19th century swords, for example, um, Austro-Hungary was next to the German states, but for the most part, German swords, obviously German, Germany wasn't unified until later in the 19th century, but um, from what we now call Germany, German swords look very distinctively different from Austro-Hungarian swords, mostly. Um, so, you know, a, a Prussian infantry officer's sword looked very different to an Austro-Hungarian infantry officer's sword. Similarly, France and England are next to each other, but French swords and British swords look completely different um, and you know the French had a love of brass hilts and particular designs the 1822 behind me has a very long service life um, and in Britain we um, we did have some swords with brass hilts but certainly for cavalry we went for steel hilts um, and you know if you just look at the Napoleonic era for example the 1796 light and heavy swords are very, very different to their French equivalents. The cuirassier sword, for example, is very iconic and again had a sort of uh, national identity attached to it and had a very long service life from the Napoleonic period right the way through to World War I. So you do absolutely get all military equipment. It's not only about function. But with this sword, with the 1934 sword, they actually brought function back in in a very, very strong way, which I'm going to explain in a second. The 1921 model was really the sword that Poland brought in to re-establish its national identity. And then if you look at the 1921 model sword, it is very much modelled on 18th century Polish sabres or shabla. Um, it, it is basically a sort of replica, of, almost, of earlier models of sword. But the 1934 model is a step away from that, and it's purely about uh, military, um, uh, well not purely, but it's, it's very much more about military uh, efficiency, 
quality of manufacturing and effectiveness. So it's almost like the marriage between these two things. You have a, the 1921 sword, which is bringing back the kind of national pride and looking at a, a sort of an earlier style of Polish sabre, which is seen as uh, iconic uh, related to the glories of um, times gone by Polish cavalry. And then in 1934, they revised this and brought in certain aspects of design and construction and quality control, which were really purely about the modern mechanised fighting machine. Now, I should mention that. So Poland, obviously, like all countries, realised that warfare had gone in the direction of tanks and planes. <laughs> Let's call it tanks and planes. So World War I had been, you know, the beginning of World War I to the end of World War One, a huge amount of technological development. You know, literally, you know, if we take the British Army, the first British kill in World War One was done with a cavalry sword. Um, and by the end of World War One, the British Army's got loads of tanks and all different types of aeroplanes with you know bombers and fighters and fighter bombers and um, and uh, you know obviously submarine warfare had gone forward a lot as well and, and over on on the sea naval warfare as well. So World War I saw a huge leap forward in technological development and a change in the face of warfare. But, as mentioned, on the uh, front, when, on the eastern front, essentially, uh, in, with the uh, Russian Revolution and then the subsequent um, conflict between um, the Soviet Union and its neighbours, there was still a lot of cavalry action because there weren't loads of tanks and planes out there. So if you don't have loads of tanks and planes and you've got large open planes and open spaces, cavalry is still super important. And um, the Polish military considered in 1934 that swords were still an important thing. Of course, 1939 and the invasion of Poland and the, the German uh, advance, armoured advance, hadn't happened yet. So we know history panned out differently. But Based on what they had seen before, it wasn't uh, an unreasonable um, assumption to make that cavalry had played an important part up to that point and would play an important part in the war to come. And in fact, contrary to popular uh, belief, and there's a lot of urban myths about World War II, um, Polish cavalry in World War II um, during the German invasion did actually play quite an important part and um, were used uh, to some degree effectively against German forces, which I'm not going to go into. That's for people who are more knowledgeable on that subject in that period than me. So this was a sword that was intended not as a parade item. It was a sword that was intended as a sword for killing people. Okay, It was a sword for fighting with. And it's very comparable in all of its main characteristics to swords from the Napoleonic era. As I say, it's not dissimilar to the British 1788 from 1788. Um, so it is a fighting sword. Now, one of the other reasons that this sabre is um, so highly respected is because it was held to very high prices production quality, um, quality control, and was also tested very, very rigorously, which in this period certainly was very unusual for swords, um, because of course in most of Europe um, swords had passed out of uh, regular kind of use in warfare. So this was subjected to tests that I, pro I suppose have their closest parallel in the testing of firearms and bayonets um, at this time, and indeed during a little bit earlier during World War I. Um, so this sword was unusual and different to its predecessors in Poland in that it was only made by one armaments factory. Now that factory, that maker in fact, which is written um, underneath the uh, langet on the sword here, we just get this camera to focus, it's actually hidden underneath the lang uh, langet, but they are Huta. Ludwikov, I think I'm saying that correctly, I'm sure I'm not, um, but um, it was only produced by one factory and that has a lot of advantages for manufacturing something because if you have a standard patent, uh, it means that you can make every item to that exact patent, so they're all exactly the same weight, exactly the same length, exactly the same distal taper, exactly the same testing they go through and the failures get thrown away, literally. Um, so you get far more regularity of your um, object that you're making, be it a bayonet, a rifle or a sword. But in addition to that, they were subjected to very rigorous tests and that's one of the reasons that these are so highly respected because not only is it just a nice feeling, nice looking sword, 
Um, but in addition to that, you know that it has gone through these tests, which a lot of modern knives and swords wouldn't necessarily survive. Uh, and as I say, if they didn't survive the test, they were thrown away. They didn't pass, they didn't get the, um, the approval. So, um, so what were these tests? Now, it has to be said that these tests, to some degree, are perhaps based on um, tests that were being done on swords in Solingen, perhaps maybe on the Wilkinson sword test, so they're not without parallel. There were 19th century swords that were being tested in similar ways to this, but the, the Polish tests were reckoned to be particularly brutal. So what are those tests? Well, so the first one um, that we're going to list is the sword had to be dropped point down, um, literally dropped onto a steel plate of two millimetres thick, presumably mild steel. Um, but the point had to... Um, one important thing, these were factory sharpened, okay? So unlike British swords, which were usually service sharpened, these were sharpened in the factory. So it had to be dropped down onto its point, onto a steel plate, and it had to penetrate that plate, make some degree of hole in that steel plate of 2 millimeter thick, which is about 14 gauge mild steel, um, uh, without any uh, deformity or damage to the point. The, um, the height that it was dropped from, incidentally, was around 2 meters, so taller than me, um, and presumably it was in some type of jig. Um, so that's got quite a lot of uh, momentum, will have picked up quite a lot of um, speed by the time it hits that steel plate. So that's quite a brutal test. The next one, you could say, is even more brutal, and that's that it would take five iron rods. It's sometimes people say steel, sometimes iron. That does actually make quite a big difference. I suspect that these were iron rods for a reason I'll explain in a second. Um, take five iron rods, and the edge of this sword was used to hack through those five iron rods that were each individually um, of five millimetres um, diameter. So you had five millimetre diameter rods, five of them, um, and you had to chop through those uh, with the edge of this sharpened sword, and it had to take no edge damage from that um, whatsoever. So that would show that your point was hard, your edge was hard. Uh, also showed to a certain degree the shock resistance as well of doing those things. Now, why do I think they were iron rods? Well, quite simply, because that test of cutting through iron rods is actually something which goes all the way back to the Napoleonic period in the 18th century, and was done certainly in Solingen and other parts of Germany. Um, and swords that pass this test often have the word Eisenhower uh, written on them, and Eisen, iron, uh, hauer, cut. Okay, so it shows that they are iron cutting swords. Um, and those were iron bars. Maybe sometimes they use steel bars, I don't know mild steel. I think sometimes the differentiation between iron and mild steel was maybe a bit fuzzy at that period, but nevertheless, let's assume they're iron, probably wrought iron bars. So you've got to hack through five, five millimeter iron bars, taking no damage to the edge. Okay. The next test is you need to whack the sword really heavily on a wooden block. And this is actually, um, paralleled by the Wilkinson test. So the Wilkinson factory in London used to do this on Victorian era British swords as well. Now in terms uh, specifically of the Polish sword, the, the model 1934, um, you might think, well, what's, that's not so bad hitting a hardwood um, a block with, with, uh, with the sword, uh, but specifically it was with the flat and the spine. Now that's quite brutal, particularly the flat. I don't think the spine is so brutal, um, but, uh, uh, you know, I suppose generally speaking, you're hitting, if you're hitting with the flat, then it's not going to penetrate the block at all. It's just going to hit it and stop. So in that sense, it's more brutal because when you hit something with the edge, the edge buries into the object, certainly if it's wood, slightly, and that dissipates some of the energy uh, and less of that energy stops in the steel of the blade. But hitting with the flat of the blade uh, repeatedly on a wooden, on a hardwood block, and then with the back of the blade on a hardwood block, uh, this could incidentally, I, I don't know in the Polish uh, example, I don't know in this specific example, but in the British tests that were like this, this could be done either by a person, and it was usually done by the blade maker, um, so it could either be done by a person or the, the approval person um, who gives the approval stamp. It could either be done by a person or it could be done by a machine, and there were machines to do these tests as well. Um, so, so that was the third test, was that it had to survive being whacked with the flat and the spine on a wooden block. The final test of the sword itself uh, was a bend test, and again this is something we see in the Wilkinson test, we see it in even modern uh, TV shows like Forged in Fire, 
um, and uh, companies like Cold Steel and that uh, do do those kind of bend tests as well. In fact, lots of um, people making swords will do some kind of bend test. And the sword had to be again put against the hardwood block and had to be flexed about 150 millimeters uh, each side, and obviously take no set, no bend. Um, so you know, fairly tough tests, although not unprecedented. And they did have. I mean, clearly when the uh, Polish um, factory uh, Ludwikov thought this up in, or, or the, in fact the government thought this up in 1934. They did have prior precedents to base this on, and it was undoubtedly based, I would suspect, probably on Sullingen manufacturing standards. Although the British uh, Wilkinson tests and the French uh, Chatelure Klingenthal uh, blade tests could have been uh, drawn upon as well. Um, so, so these kinds of tests were being done in various countries. But uh, this was a relatively brutal test. It was uh, kind of as brutal as, within the context of those 19th century blade tests, as brutal as they get. And there was a final test, and that was actually of the scabbard rather than the sword. I haven't really talked about the scabbard so far. So the scabbard is relatively straightforward. It's a steel scabbard. It has a um, softer metal um, throat. I can tell you that from this original because I can see where the edge of the blade has scoured the inside of the throat. So to help the blade be slightly less bluntened by continual drawing and sheathing, um, they usually use a slightly softer metal uh, throat here at the scabbard. But the rest of the scabbard is made of iron or mild steel probably. Um, and it has a fairly simple shoe or drag at the bottom, fairly squared off one. And it has one ring, which as I mentioned in my Italian Model 1833 video, is quite typical of uh, cavalry swords after about 1890. This, just for some reason, everyone switched from having two rings worn from the belt to having one ring which predominantly was uh, attached to the saddle uh, rather than the rider. Um, and that was partly, of course, because by this point, cavalry was so frequently dismounting and mounting, so they would often ride to a position, dismount, fire rifles, then mount up and ride off. So they didn't want to be clattering around with their sabres attached to them all the time, necessarily. Um, and very often the sword would be attached to the horse and was only there to administer a cavalry charge or to get into horseback fighting, should that occur. Uh, but they acted as... Um, essentially riflemen on foot, a bit like dragoons uh, a lot of the time. Um, so, uh, oh, and the scabbard, so what did it do? They had to put, uh, essentially it was put, uh, supported at both ends and um, a weight was put on it, I think of 120 kilograms, uh, a weight was put on the middle and the, the scabbard had to not bend. So it was essentially a scabbard test. So we got a test of the scabbard, which I don't recall ever seeing before any, in a, any actual sword tests. They always talk about testing the swords, but they don't talk about testing the scabbards. And given how many bent and broken scabbards I come across in the antique dealing world, uh, probably a good thing um, that the scabbard was uh, robust and this one has you know it has some little dents down at the bottom but it's uh, in pretty good condition so uh, there we go to summarize the polish um, wz 1934 um, shabla um, made by uh, huta ludwikov i think i'm pronouncing that right of and i don't know how to say the pla place name instantly they were based in kielce I think. I don't know how to say that. Kielce? Kielce? This is actually a 1939 dated sword and you can tell um, the dates of them from the serial numbers on the spine um, and they had a different letter for each year and this is a D. This is D543. Um, so D corresponds to 1939. C is 1938 and so on. Um, and uh, so these were only made for a few years uh, but they were made in quite large numbers. So the question is, and I haven't found a definitive answer yet, why are these, we know why these are so sought after, because they're awesome swords, they're lovely, they look nice, uh, they have a history behind them, but also they, ha they represent something as well. They represent the last sword, really, that Poland used in, in, in warfare. Um, and also they represent things to do with Polish independence and, and all of this kind of stuff. Um, but why are they so rare as objects? As I say, they're not super super rare but they are rare enough that when they come up for sale um, it's quite difficult to get a hold of one. Um, so why are they so rare? Well probably we think this is the prevailing theory I think uh, and feel free if you know more about this subject than me because I'm sure there are people watching this video who certainly do know more about these swords than me. As you know I'm mostly a, a British uh, sword guy um, but my understanding is that um, these swords were replaced 
um, after the um, sec uh, yes after the Second World War, um, when the Soviets essentially took over, they replaced these as uh, these were taken out of, you know, kind of parade use or any other kind of use, and also under German occupation as well, of course, um, and possibly disposed of, destroyed, don't know, re recycled maybe, maybe the steel was recycled, we, we don't really know. Um, and the Russians, I believe, made Polish cavalry units wear the Russian shashka for some amount of time. And then I think in the 1970s, um, the Polish were allowed to have their own style of sword again. Um, so essentially it seems like this sword was sort of prohibited and destroyed and done away with in that period of first of German occupation and then of Soviet occupation um, during those years, uh, during and after the Second World War. Hence, not a huge number of these are around. There's probably some in Russia, there's probably some obviously in uh, Germany. And, it is, it is entirely possible that some of these made their way west during the Second World War, during the fall of Poland, because um, obviously some people managed to get out of Poland uh, once Germany took over. Um, so it's possible that some of them came out at that time. It's possible that some of them were in storage or hidden or we don't really know. Um, so the end result is these are highly desirable swords, very nice swords, and there's a lot, a lot of them about, which is a sort of golden <laughs> uh, it's a combination of things which mean that these are pretty damn expensive now, um, for um, certainly for 20th century swords, these are super expensive. But a wonderful thing, I'm glad that I have been privileged to have it for a fairly short amount of time actually, I've only had it for a couple of weeks. Um, but I'm very honoured that I get to show one of these on my channel because I suspect that I'll never get to own one of these again. It doesn't fit in my collection. Um, it's a very nice thing, but I want it to go to someone else who really appreciates the history of these and, and, uh, and what they are and really wants one of these. Um, and um, thank you for watching the video. Give us a like and a subscribe. And as I say, if you have particular bits of information about this sword and their use, I would love it if you share that information um, below. And um, particularly, I understand that there is some implication that some of these were used in combat during World War II. Um, if you know of accounts of these being used in World War II, I would absolutely love to read those because I love first-hand combat accounts. Um, so uh, by all means, share, share that underneath. And all I will say for now is give us a like and a subscribe if you haven't done already. Jean Dobre and uh, see you all soon back on Scholar Gladiatorial Channel. Cheers, folks! Thanks for watching. We've got extra videos on Patreon. Please give our Facebook a like and subscribe if you haven't already. Cheers, folks.